Good evening. My name is Sharon Harris Ewing. I serve as Assistant Minister at Naples United Church of Christ. I'm joined by my colleague, friend, and chair of the Church's Justice Committee, Jennifer Walker. Many of you know Jen as a longtime leader in the community, including being president of Greater Naples Leadership and board chair of the Community Foundation. This evening, we are ending an eight-week series that started on June 10th. On the first evening, our senior minister, Reverend Dr. Dawson Taylor, confessed on behalf of all of us that we had not planned to offer a program addressing race and privilege. Indeed, the church as a church had done little to examine or defeat racism. It was not until the deaths of Ahmed Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd that he, as a Christian, along with the entire clergy team, all of us, white people of privilege, intentionally designed this series of sacred conversations on race and privilege. The first week, the clergy team interviewed two guests, Reverend Dr. Bernice Powell Jackson, pastor of the First United Church of Tampa, and a lifelong activist on behalf of human and civil rights, women's rights, peace with justice and Reverend Dr. Stephen Ray, president of Chicago Theological Seminary and president of the Society of Black Religion, a scholar who has written and lectured broadly in the areas of systematic theology, African-American religion, and human rights. The second week, Dawson interviewed his friend, Reverend Justin Coleman, senior pastor of University United Methodist Church in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. They grew up together in suburban Houston and both became pastors leading large congregations, one a white man and one a black man. They shared with each other and with us their journeys that have been both alike and different. For the following five weeks, the Naples UCC clergy team has discussed the book, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. We have sought more than anything else to learn. The book is rich and complex and deeply thought-provoking as Kendi weaves together his own personal experiences, well-researched history of the slave trade and racist ideas, and a carefully articulated framework of racism and anti-racism. He is clear that he does not believe there is anything in between. So tonight, we are moving from general ideas and descriptions of race and privilege to a more specific focus on our local community, Naples and Collier County. Jen and I, the Justice Te Committee, the clergy team, and our viewers have, over the last seven weeks, been very clearly made aware that there is so much we do not know about the big and small ways that people of color experience racism in their daily lives. So we have invited local leaders to help us learn from them. That's our goal. We will ask them, what now? In the sense of, what is going on now? That we don't know, but we should. We will also ask them, what now, in the sense of, what can we do now to make a difference? I've asked them to speak the truth in love. So let's begin by introducing them. Jen? Our guests tonight uh, have long and rich achievements, and to save time, I won't go over the details that we had that you've all read. But I do want to say that uh, welcoming Vincent Keyes, who is the president of the Collier County branch of the NAACP. The NAACP wants to ensure a society in which all individuals have equal rights and there is no racial hatred or racial discrimination. Vincent and Diane, his wife of 40 years, have lived in Naples since 2004, and he is a native of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. 
Jim and Harriet Lancaster have lived in Naples since 2001, when I first met Harriet, and then Jim. They were married in Washington, D.C. 54 years ago and have three adult children and four grandsons. Since moving to Naples, both have been very active community leaders in many organizations, including the NAACP, Immokalee Housing and Family Services, the Haitian Coalition of Collier County, Collier Senior Resources Center, and Hope for Haiti and the Unitarian Universalist Congregation. Thank you all for being with us this evening. So this is What Now, Part 1. What is happening now in Collier County that we need to learn about? We would like to hear about your experiences. Jen did some research to set the stage for our questions. According to the most recent census data available, the population of Collier County is 384,902. Of that, 62.2% are white, non-Hispanic. 28.6% are Hispanic. 27.1% of them identify as white. 7.3% are African American black, including Haitian Americans. 1.6% are Asian, and a half a percent are American Indian, Alaska Native. So from those numbers, it is clear that the number of black people in this region is small. Our first question is, what has that been like for you? Overall, what has your experience been as a black man and an interracial couple? You might include differences between living here and living in other parts of the country or other parts of the world, because you all moved here later in your lives. What are some things that we don't know, but we should? Vincent, would you start this one? First of all, before I get started, let me uh, at least thank the Naples United Church of Christ for bringing together this forum. It is a pleasure. I have to admit, Although I do not know what it's like to uh, be a interracial couple, <laughs> my wife and I uh, are from different and so I could imagine that it's a little difficult to bring two cultures together. And so from that point of view, I, I understand uh, Jim and Harriet's relationship somewhat. But I would like to say that there have been major differences I think that we all could see. Particularly when we talk about some of the protests that are taking place in not only Naples, and here it may only happen once a week, but uh, what's going on across the nation. And in Portland in particular, it is happening daily. And so I think we could all see that in particularly. Um, also, the daily consciousness shows that people are, are actually dying for this issue on equality, particularly to state that Black Lives Matter, and not only to mention the current day pandemic for which we're living under. And that uh, here in Naples, although it is paradise to so many, but to some, it is still being reduced to being a second-class citizen for others. And so that is rather troubling still in 2020. Jim and Harriet. Okay, I'm gonna respond just a minute to Vince about the two cultures. Jim and I have always had very similar values. So the issue hasn't been our communication, the issue is how the rest of the world sees us. And when we first came 
in 2001. Jim wanted to stay. I said, no, way too conservative for me. I don't like this place. And we found the Unitarian congregation and they were wonderful. And so I agreed we could buy a condo where we'd live three months by the next year. Of course, we were here seven or eight months every year. Uh, so we started looking. We went to Pelican Bay. Jim and I walked into the sales office and the first thing the woman who came up to so-called, you know, talk to us about sales said, there's no place for you here. We know you can't afford anything in this, in this development. <laughs> she never asked us what our um, financial resources were. She made an assumption based on race, clearly. I wanted to go to the state or the county. I don't know if it would have done much good, but I really did. And Jim said, no, let's just find a place. I think he was afraid I changed my mind. So then we saw for Pelican Marsh um, um, a brochure and it had a black couple on it. We said, okay, we'll go there. That'll be more accepting. And by that time, we'd gotten a realtor. So we ended up buying a carriage house in Pelican Marsh. We later found out that probably that picture was on the pamphlet because of their own civil rights issues. So. Uh, there were very few people of color in the whole development, it's a couple thousand homes. Um, so my homeowners association president always gave me dirty looks and I went to all of the meetings. And after four years, we decided to move into a house in Village Walk where uh, there were a number of Unitarians living. And we thought we'd be more comfortable there. And our kids didn't like walking around Pelican Marsh because people were not friendly at that time. Um, so in, this was 2005 by then. And so then when we put our condo up for sale, the president of our homeowners association said to me, you know, when you moved in, I was really upset. I thought our property values were gonna go down. This is 2005, our property values were gonna go down. And he said, I was so surprised when I met your children at the pool. One's a doctor, one's a PhD. I mean, they're all, all three are better educated than my children. <clears throat> assumptions, assumptions, huh? So um, we moved into uh, Village Walk, and yes, it was better, not without its you know, uh, problems, but much better. And we had a pair of gay friends, wonderful men, who we, we knew in about, uh, maybe it was 12 or 15, maybe 2015, they said they couldn't take it anymore. People were always staring at them, and they were gonna move. And um, they said, how do you manage? And I said, I don't care if people stare at me. I've long passed that. We've been together so long. It's their problem, not ours. But yeah, I think interracial couples are not as unique as they used to be now, but people still pay attention to you. And yeah. so, I mean, do, living here, I found my, my community, Jim found his community. We are fine living here at this point. Jim, can you share some of your experiences? Well, being here, uh, during those first uh, three months, all first year, I noticed that uh, there was a population from Haiti. Um, there were individuals from Central America. There were whites and there were blacks. But also I noticed that the Latino population was getting funds from nonprofit organizations. With the exception of Hope for Haiti, maybe. Which was uh, overseas. Which was overseas, mm -hmm. yes. The, um, the Haitian community. The, 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 I'm sorry, yeah. The, the Haitian community were very, very small, and they were not getting any attention from any of the nonprofit organizations. And then I found that there was a pocket of the Latino population that bundles of uh, rules of funds were going to the community. So it was my desire to meet all three and all four of the organizations or individuals uh, to work together and to increase the level of education 
to increase the uh, knowledge and skills for the health and to have projects that um, was were able to do the, make these improvements. Um, so this is was the beginning of um, getting involved into the community and working in these areas. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, you may have started to answer that this question, and so um, if if you've talked about one aspect of it, uh, forgive me. But I wanted to know what aspects of the of our community here in Collier County, uh, what aspects of our life do you perceive the greatest challenges to equality for blacks? Is it, uh, in other words, put another way, is there is where is systemic racism most evident to you? Is it perhaps in job opportunities, income, housing? Certainly, Harriet addressed that already. Uh, education, law enforcement. Um, voting, health care, political leadership, even church attendance. Um, Jim, did you want to um, start out? You ended the last one. Well, again, um, we established a program in Immokalee uh, for health care. When I say we, it was a nonprofit organization. And we had um, the uh, session, if you will, in Immokalee and more than 200 and some individuals came. And then the other place was in Golden Gate. And we had problems of individuals with um, high blood pressure. And one was indeed, uh, we had to have a call an ambulance to take care of uh, one of the participants who came for that day. Um, so we saw that as a significant impact of health where individuals were not able to go to work, the kids were not able to go to school, um, and there was serious um, health issues. Um, and then we also, in, in Haiti, where there were many, many, many uh, individuals, um, and we established programs in education and water purification, um, with um, establishing gardens and small gardens and income from the small gardens. And so I found that the mechanism in terms of the generosity of the individuals in this community uh, and solving a lot of problems that we are dealing with. And um, this was 10 years ago and f five years ago and current today, we had significant growth, significant funds in giving uh, attention to these communities. Yeah, to follow up on the issue of healthcare, I think the expansion of Medicaid in this state is so important because minorities are particularly hard hit in the p pandemic now um, and uh, ma you know, maternal mortality, which the League of Women Voters is working on. It's, um, we, we've just got to expand Medicaid and get people more, more care. And even Medicare, when I was with Collier Senior Resources, we were getting ready to start the Golden Gate Senior Center, and Pastor John Paul, who's Haitian, set up a focus group for me so I, we could talk with Haitians. And one of the women there was so poignant. She said, I have, I'm a citizen, I have Medicare, but I can't afford the 20% copay. I have no way of getting additional insurance, so I just don't go to the doctor. And so there are lots of health issues. There are certain other issues. Um, the other one that really bothers me right now, of course, is Amendment 4 that was supposed to enable returned citizens to felons um, to vote once they had served their time. And then the um, state legislature have additional requirements in terms of having to pay any court fees, etc. And people have stepped up and say they, they would pay, but the state doesn't know how much people owe. So it's a catch-22. They can't register. And out of, um, I don't know, maybe Vince knows, maybe a million felons, only 85,000 have 1. been able to register. 1.5 million, yes. 1. 1.5 and only 85,000 have been able to register. So yeah, voting rights are an issue. 
Um, you know, housing's an issue. There are so many issues. Uh, systemic racism um, just gets in the way of equity on almost every turn. How about Vincent, you, Vincent? You uh, what? Yeah. Vincent, can you add to that? And, and so, yes, I would, I would agree. Yes, I, I would agree that uh, in every facet of society, it can be identified. It can be identified, of course, in housing, education, uh, the economy, policing of, of uh, citizens, and particularly in the criminal justice area. As Harriet pointed out, Bill 7066 is one that we, the citizens, decided on uh, in the last election. But yet still, people, felons, who have paid their debts to society still are not given an opportunity to fully become first-class citizens. We, we have this legacy of reducing people to second-class citizenship. And I mean in every form, every area of housing. Uh, let's, let's face it, to give you an example, and, and it's amazing that this is 2020, and just recently, the city of Washington, D.C., which Harriet and Jim know very well, just passed the statehood rights for its citizens. For such a long time, despite the fact that they were citizens of Washington, D.C. and paid federal taxes, and they were not allowed to participate in the voting for, oh my goodness, state representatives, the U.S. House, the U.S. Senate, and that's a tragedy that those people have suffered under for such a long time. And so you can see those disparities out there. We know of so many of the tragedies that people are suffering under. And now I honestly believe with the passing of John Lewis mm -hmm. in the area of voting rights, there is too much suppression out there. And so the fight for us all is left here for us to finish. Well, we're going to come back to um, the election and voting rights in just a minute. Um, but again, we, we're focusing locally and thinking about your kinds of specific um, experiences. Obviously, um, neither Collier County in general nor the black population in this area are monolithic. There's diversity. There are distinct coastal communities and there are rural farm communities. There are black professionals and entrepreneurs. Um, there's a black Haitian committee or com community. Um, in Immokalee, there are Hispanic migrant farm workers. What are the similarities and the differences between different groups of black people in Collier County? How do they relate to each other, if at all? Um, help us understand so that we don't just think about blacks as all one and the same. What are, what are some of the um, differences within the community? Do you want Harriet to start? Uh, yes, Harriet, please start. Yeah, I'll start. Well, I worked in Immokalee for maybe 10, 12 years with Immokalee Housing and Family Services. Um, there were some uh, African-Americans, um, more Haitians, and of course, my, many more uh, Latinx people. Um, the Haitians tended to be the packers and the, um, the Hispanics tend to be the pickers. Um, and I've seen change there. You know, it's a community that is working to better itself. I think the worst poverty I've seen among African-Americans in Southern Florida is in Henry, 
where uh, the sugar plantations, the African Americans there are what they call literally dirt poor. They reminded, I worked for five years as Peace Corps director in Ghana in West Africa, and it's bad. It reminds me of the third world. Um, but we have many um, middle and upper middle class and very wealthy blacks who live in gated communities. They're dispersed, but they're around. We have good friends from DC who live in one of these communities here who are extremely well off. So there is really a range. Um, some are interested in working on the issues, some are not. But what, what is common to everybody if you're of color is that um, people will, what is it Martin Luther King said, um, he, he wants to see people judge by their character and not by the color of their skin, but it does feel for the most part here, people are still judged by the color of their skin. Jim, you want to follow up? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, indicate that there, the Latino population were receiving um, a significant amount of grants and kind going to the community, uh, be it housing, jobs, uh, and health. But I found that the Asian community. Um, for the last man on the on the ladder on the totem pole, yeah. and, um, and so I took an interest interest in both the um, Haitian population in Naples as well as in in Haiti, and I would hope that con continue uh, funds will come into the that population as well as the population that we work with in the Hispanic. Thank you. Vincent. Vincent. Well, uh, as so many have pointed out, uh, there are uh, a lot of cultural differences and uh, similarities. I tend to believe that uh, Blacks that I know who have uh, political interests many times are, are shut out. Uh, there was an observation that has been made uh, of city council um, and even, and even uh, on the county commissioner's seats, they have never seen African-Americans represented. And so um, I tend to believe that a lot could be done to improve those kind of conditions. And it's not a coincidence, I believe, that so many people live in poverty. I'm always absolutely shocked and amazed whenever I go to a Mockley. And I know myself, I grew up in poverty. And so to climb the ladder to get out is very few it's it's very difficult and i just believe when i look at say for example the criminal justice system that jim crow has made a movement uh from from the jailhouse into society and it's enslaving too many, too many blacks. So I, I just, I just look at the whole, and I guess uh, see too many differences, and say that we could make, make a lot of improvement. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, we did talk a little about this, maybe more than um, my questions uh, cover. But let's go back to the fact that this is an election year. And there's been a lot of attention on racism and the Black Lives Matter movement. There's a concern among many about voter suppression. We keep hearing about that in other states. Um, and so we're, we're wondering if you, if you feel that there is in any way that blacks, people of color, are being targeted, are being held back from their 
there's their constitutional right to vote? Are there insufficient polling places? And if you can speak about what's going on here locally, if, if you feel there's any of this going on, we'd want to know about that. Hassles with uh, identification, uh, removing names from voter registration lists. If you haven't voted in the last general election, do you get removed? I've forgotten. I'm a member of League of Women Voters, and Harriet, you can, you can certainly answer that question. But what are your greatest concerns about protecting the voting rights and ensuring that black voices are heard in the election? And we'll start with you, Vincent, but you were already touching on some of it. Do you have more to add? Well, yes, I, I, I have a, a lot to add only for the simple reason that um, voting is one of the most essential rights that our citizens have. And it just would seem like we would cherish and protect that right to make sure that everyone participates in our democracy. Uh, John Lewis spent his whole life campaigning and being beat in life so that our youth would have the right to vote. So I just know of the voter suppression that takes place in our communities out of the 60 precincts that we have here in Collier County, it takes place every election period. And so we watch the communities of Immokalee. We protect and watch the communities of Golden Gate. These are some of our trouble areas right here in Collier County. So I know there is so much to do in terms of voter protection. 216,000 people are able to vote. And if there's only one precinct in that densely populated area of Golden Gate and only one precinct in a densely populated area of Immokalee, goes to show the kind of voter suppression that takes place. And now, under the current day pandemic, the best way to exercise that right to vote is to mail in your ballot. Right. And that is to mail it in early. Guarantee there will be problems from the United States Postal Service in getting those ballots to the supervisor of election on time. So we are encouraging people, vote early. We need to do a lot more in terms of strengthening the Voting Rights Act of 1965. There has been a lot of eroding and gutting of that act and we need to go out of our way to protect our citizens so that they can vote. So we have so much to do and that is my cause in life. Well, good, it's a good cause and I'm glad you have that. Uh, and I know Harriet, League of Women Voters, yeah, You're very I thought involved it was too. Uh, they were taking people off the rolls who hadn't voted in the last two elections, but I may have that wrong. Mm. And one of the issues around that, first, I don't think that's valid, but beyond that, people have similar names. So a lot of people get knocked off who have been voting. That's right. And it seems to fall disproportionately on minorities. So, I wanted to also add in that from the um, I must say experience, but going to do the polls, their literature in English, Spanish, and nothing in, in, Haitian. in Haitian. Nothing in Creole. 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 And I don't, I've raised that issue several times and just get a blank stare, so I don't understand why yeah. this is so. 
the Board of Supervisors Election says that uh, there's not a sufficient number of Asian voters. I don't know what they think the threshold is. Are they is. allowed to have a translator with them? I don't, I mean, I'm not sure. Do you know? No, I think you can have a helper if you've got an a impairment, if you're blind or deaf or something. But I don't know about this language. Wow. We're, yeah. gonna, we're going to pivot now and um, start talking about what now in the sense of next steps, of what can we do to be anti-racist, making a difference in Naples and Collier County. I know that all of you have been activists against racism for decades. Some people think this time in history is um, a watershed that, um, for example, saying Black Lives Matter has become much more acceptable. Even corporations are telling us about how Black Lives Matter to them. Um, what do you think? Is this the beginning of real change? Jim? I'm going to pass that on to Vince. <laughs> <laughs> if he doesn't think it's the beginning of real change. Well, no. we need to hear that point of view. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's a it's a real change, that's for sure. Uh, uh, Harriet, maybe you'd like to, you know. I can say what our kids say. Our, our kids have been out there on the protests, and they yes. say they've never seen so many white people protesting. So they believe it's different this time because of that. But you know, I've been protesting for so long. Um, I'm not sure. I'm I'm hopeful, but. Um, I think it's possible there'll be real change. Do I think it's probable? Not really, but I would like to believe it's possible. I I I uh, I know Harriet. It's possible because this time, it's not all blacks out there protesting. You know, when when it was all blacks protesting, some discount uh, uh, the movement, but today. It is black, white, brown people out in force. We believe that the systemic racism should be behind us. It is just shocking to see federal forces out in Portland. If this were Boston, no taxation without representation. I'm appalled that these kind of things would be going on in our country. I just believe that when we saw the knee on George Floyd's neck, it was a harsh reality that black people are up against and have been up against for years. You know, we have been trying to get the lynching act passed for years and it has yet to pass the house or Congress, but it ought to be a crime for our own people to, or white supremacists to figure that they are judge, court, and jury of our society. They should not be allowed. The bigotry that we are seeing, the uprising that we are seeing should not be. And so we've seen a rollback. That's the reason why you have the entire community of black, white, and brown people coming out. There's a difference. Yeah, right. I wanted to bring one other thing. I have a friend whose daughter is a lawyer at the Department of Navy, and she sent me a copy of a presentation her daughter did on a panel, and it was how to be a white ally. And it was a really good presentation, but this is the Navy Department, so I was very impressed. It's beginning to get down into the inner of our society, and that's what's important because so much of it, I mean, there is personal racism and there is certainly internalized oppression or internalized racism, 
but the systemic racism is the worst part that well, that has the most impact on people's lives well harriet if you would be so kind to email me that uh, if you've got okay. it i, I would I appreciate have to ask it Dina if it's all right because young dina only wanted jim and i to read it okay. she's a little shy about it so well, if Dina says it's all right, I will But ask. we are trying to be a white ally. I mean, that's mm -hmm. certainly our, uh, one of our goals. And um, I'd like to just continue this discussion by asking, uh, well, Vincent, you're the president of the Collier County NAACP, Jim and Harriet. You've been part of that group as well as many others in the community. Uh, we'd like to hear from each of you. What have you done that you think has been most effective or helpful um, in this effort to um, mitigate, to get rid of systemic racism. Are there any efforts underway now that people like Sharon and me and all those who are watching uh, could join and support? Looking forward, what could you, uh, what could and should we start doing? Now we're talking about us. How can we make a difference against racism? Um, Harriet, you want to start? Yeah, I think we start with ourselves and our own congregations. Um, I'm a Unitarian. We're going to do um, an anti-racism series in our uh, congregation. For the last three years, the Unitarians, prompted by um, minority ministers and uh, the gay and lesbian community, have been doing a study. And they finished it on uh, institutional change and. 15 things we can do. I'll send you that when I, I have it. It's 200 pages long. Oh, if you no. want it, you can have it. Uh, but we're going to be working on that, not just studying it, because reading books and reading reports are not enough. I hope at the end of each one, we'll come up with what action activities we will do. And I want to urge my congregation, and I hope you'll urge your own congregations to look at the work they do. If they're lawyers, how can they help? If they're bankers, well, we all know that it's very hard for African Americans to get mortgages, to get business loans. Uh, perhaps they can help with their own um, businesses or their own boards. Um, I, I just think we all have to start with where we are. Um, I mean, our minister started when he first joined. We, and he joined the... Um, African American Ministers Association, the only white face there. And I was just so pleased with him because he wasn't expecting anything in return. He, he just wanted to be there. And um, we need to, uh, you know, do I think that we can fully integrate our congregation? No, not in this, not in, not in Collier County. I don't believe it's possible. I came from an integrated congregation in Washington, D.C., but it was a little different demographics. Um, but I do believe that we can reach out and be allies to African-American organizations in this in, in Collier. And I think that's what we need to do, start with ourselves. Uh, Jim, you've been involved with the Haitian uh, community, and I know you know Reverend John Paul, the pastor of the, uh, I don't know the name of that church, but it's a Haitian church. Um, do you... The Lazarine, Church of the Lazarine. Oh, Church of the Nazarene, thank you. And I was wondering, well, you or Jim or Vincent, whether maybe uh, congregations visiting each other might be a positive move. Do you think so? Yeah, it always helps to know other people, to, you know, to get past stereotypes. You have to know somebody, although that's not enough. It's a beginning. <laughs> no, I'm not going to come back to it, but I... I wanted to um, tell you that in 1960, 1961, I went to um, Istanbul, Turkey, um, through the uh, American, American, Friends. American Friends Service Committee and a Peace Corps volunteer in Nigeria for two years. And um, one with, I can't remember the organization, but uh, a year in Istanbul, Turkey, and I'm grown. And I saw all the poverty that exists in these kind of communities in these countries. At the time. Yeah. At that time. And I, I completed my master's and went to work for the Office of Management and Budget. And I was an invisible man there. Uh, I was in there with the Nixon Ford administration. Um, but I learned 
over these past um, 40 years, I guess, 50 years, 60. Uh, <laughs> 55 years, <laughs> um, and in doing what is what I think is right to do. And it was not just because of Harriet and myself, but I think because of the values that we hold, the values that we also are teaching our children and our grandchildren um, to what is right and what is wrong. Um, and so, but it is difficult to, for that. I mean, I was uh, on the highway once and uh, was driving and was stopped by a police and officer there and um, was told uh, to get out of the car. And um, oh, this was in Naples. This was downtown Naples. Oh, my goodness. No, this was on the, oh another, on the road, one. another one. Oh, okay. And um, there was a rifle in the, in the car. Oh, yeah. That and one. Um, the guy, I was scared to death um, being in, the, in this situation. But when I showed my, uh, my passport to, to OMB, I was a good Oh, your, yeah, I was your a good badge. Boy. Yeah. <laughs> then they let us go. That was in, um, that was. I yeah, think South or South Carolina. Carolina. It was in South Carolina. We were with another couple, both lawyers. She was not white, but she was light. So two white women and two, two black, black men. It didn't work well in South Carolina. But we've had an experience in uh, in Naples. We were leaving a Hope for Haiti board meeting. This was only maybe four years ago. And the the attendant forgot to put the lights on, and it was it was late, about eleven, not terribly late, late for Collier. And uh, so the police pulled us over and said, "You're driving without your lights on." And they said, "Have you had a drink?" And I don't drink. But Jim said, "Yes, I had two glasses of wine." And he made Jim get out and walk a line. And then he said to Jim, um, "I want you to hop on one foot." And I went ballistic. I said, "He's got he's." He's in his late 70s at the time. And I said, he has stenosis of the spine. He can't hop on both feet. I said, why are you doing this? I know that Kevin uh, trained better than that because Rand Hawk used to be the, the city uh, head of police. And so he got, he understood what I was saying right away. And he said, why do you think I'm a racist? And I said, does it fit? And he said, all right, you can go, but you have to drive. I said, he's the better driver. He said, you have to drive. So we, we drove away. But we've been stopped more than once, coming from an NAACP meeting once at a Golden Gate. With everyone passing us, this guy pulled us over and um, wanted to see the license. Jim was driving. And he said to Jim, you live up there? I said, yes, we live in Pelican Marsh. And Jim said, yes, that's our zip code. That's where we live, Pelican Marsh. And he said, okay, you can go. That was it. I mean, it's, it's here. It's in Collier. Now, it's gotten somewhat better over the years, but it's there. All right. So, Vince, have you had similar experiences? Harriet and, and Jim were talking about uh, being profiled while driving. Oh, boy. That's a, a, a good one because... I mean, it happens so very often. Uh, you, and you want to talk about specifically here in Naples, correct? Right. Okay, very good. All right. Um, and, and where are we at question number six, just to make sure? Right. Okay, okay. So, um, yeah, I can make some observations on uh, things that have happened to me here recently. You ready? Ready. Excellent. Um, as many of you may know, I uh, am a seaman. And so from time to time, I like to take a day off to enjoy uh, Gordon's River. Mm -hmm. And I can recall when I first moved to Naples, I uh, had gotten pulled over by a police officer and I happened to be towing my boat. Uh, and, and I was asked a whole host of questions. And at the same time being asked a whole host of questions, once he cleared my driver's license and, and there was no reason for him to have, have stopped me, he then began to um, focus in on my passenger who was in the car with me. 
Uh, and and he ran his identification. Huh? And then after finding out there was no problem with his identification, then he began to focus on, on my boat. Huh. Well, once all three things were outruled and he didn't have a reason uh, to stop me, he says there have been a lot of... Uh, occasions when people have gotten their boats stolen so i thought it was just wise for me to check it out and that's that's the only reason why i pulled you over i apologize and he just let me go and i thought about that afterwards and i said to myself for what reason none other than his idea well, there had been other thefts in the area. I, and I really didn't believe it after, after thinking about it because it was a preconceived idea in his mind that n no black man can own a, a boat. So let me find out, <laughs> let me pull him over and find out if he's legitimate or not. So, I mean, I laugh about those things all the time when it happens to me. Fortunately enough, it has never um, escalated to the point where someone's life was lost as a result of it. Because I cannot believe that out of the suspicion of a $20 bill that you could being black, be be choked to death, to the point of death. So it's just uh, one of those things. I have to admit, though, uh, th those are, are personal things that occur, and, and I try not to commit it to uh, racism or systematic racism, but I, as the president, of the Collier County branch of the NAACP have made several observations and developed strategic plans. Strategic plans that have changed, I think, the uh, dynamics of the branch. We have, you know, mobilized and, and, and organized among ourselves and created opportunities. Uh, one of the most recent things, and this I believe, Sharon, you can play a part in. I'm listening. For example, for example, with the new pandemic, realize there have been a lot of people in the unemployment lines. And in fact, there's a lot of miseducation out there. So recently, the NAACP has been having COVID virus giveaways where we have been with the cooperation and partnership of the Collier County Sheriff's Office, we have been providing masks, gloves, hand sanitizer, food, and gift cards to people because I cannot believe that in this day and time, you could design a website that could go down. We never made the necessary preparation. And when we knew the pandemic was coming, we allowed it to slap us dead in the face. No preparation was done whatsoever. And so I'm happy to say that the Collier County branch has been feeding over 12,000 people in our county and the lines just keep coming. So Sharon, please join us to help to feed the needy. And I believe that's what all churches ought to be doing during this day and time because unfortunately there is no master plan out there and we, on the state level have been left and on the county level have been left to fend for ourselves. I, I want to thank you for that, Vincent. And um, 
I will off camera f get more information from you. Um, I can tell you that one of our partners is Grace Place, and we have continued um, to give them food and also to make substantial donations during this pandemic to make sure that that place where people get food is supported. We certainly um, support feeding the hungry, and it it is a tragedy that there are so many hungry people in Collier County. It um, is a real tragedy. My next question was actually about churches, and we've already um, talked a little about um, churches, so um, I'm actually going to um, just ask if there's anything more before Jen goes to the last question. Any more suggestions? Vincent's just given us another one um, about this effort to feed. Anything else that comes to mind that individuals or churches can do, um, efforts that are already underway, or things that we can start? Well, I'll just say it again. I've said it before, a lobby for Medicaid expansion. And if we have the opportunity for the expansion of the Affordable Care Act, um, I just think health care is so, so important for everybody. And economic justice, of course. There are all kinds of ways to work on economic justice. And there's no reason why our church and our church members can't be involved in that. Thank you. I believe that every church in the United States should have a justice committee um, uh, to deal with health care and law enforcement and housing and it's, it's just I can't understand why there does not exist in any of these churches some have them some have them just, well yeah those who have them God bless them well thank you we just have a brand new one and I am chair of the justice committee um, and we will be talking with the Unitarian congregation, with the temple, and other faith groups uh, to learn more from them also, the Justice Committee. So that is a future program that we're planning for the church. Um, throughout this series, we've tried to end on a note of hope. Uh, between, the between the challenges of the pandemic, concerns about the economy, and the painful reality of racism across our nation, it's easy to become discouraged. So I want to ask each of you, what gives you hope in these days? Dare I start with you, Jim? Yeah, I, I, I feel disappointed. And it all depends. Whether it is. <laughs> You know, who's going to be the president? To be the Senate? Who's going to be from the court, Supreme Justice? It, and that's only less than 100 days from today. Ask me this question come November. I will, Jim. I hope it's one that we can be hopeful with. How about you, Harriet? Mm -hmm. Well, my grandsons, um, and my kids, they're wonderful. Um, and they don't seem to bear any internalized oppression. And that's not easy in this society. When you're put down enough, it's you. And that's, that's a real risk. And I remember my And they just couldn't believe a black woman would ride horseback. And they wanted to know what the ghetto was like. And of course, she had never lived in a ghetto in her life. So um, these kids are strong. Um, they're making change. They're working hard. And they represent a whole generation or two generations. And, and that gives me hope. I think it will be different in the future. I, I do believe what Jim Kinney, the lecturer, says, you know, he's uh, a, a background in comparative uh, religions, and he says, this is the last gasp of the patriarchy, and it's just gasping for a long time, but I'm hoping that we will see a different world, a just world, an equitable world, and uh, this part of creating an equitable world.
Well, I have to admit, I try and be very optimistic these days, but it's difficult. Uh, I do want to say, uh, to close off part of the last question, uh, particularly when it comes to what the church uh, can do, even knowing that your church is predominantly uh, uh, white. I, I would like to suggest, if I may, um, you know, more diversity and inclusive partnerships. I think today under the current climate, uh, working together with others, and of course, by Zoom or whatever, uh, invitations of this kind, where, where the UUC, as well as the uh, Naples United Church of Christ could, could combine together. I, I would also like to extend an invitation for both congregations to help us on the Complete Count Committee. The 2020 census is so critically important and it has such a major impact on Collier County that I would be remiss not to mention. It's an opportunity for us all, and I have to tell you that I have identified communities west of 41 that have not participated in the census this year. Wow. And that's heartening when, when, when I realize there's a pandemic going on, but we have been given an extension until October the 31st for us to beat the 2010 census numbers. And in 2010, we left 39%, excuse me, 29% of the money on the table that we could have gotten for our county. Only 71% of the people responded to the census. Oh, wow. So I would urge you to have reach out sessions at your church to be a part of. I've been given the task of being the chair of that complete count committee. And that's the reason why I'm begging and pleading for your help. Also, I would suggest that your church like I said, join with others, be more accepting of others, and not to uh, uh, make assumptions based on the color of one's skin, but of the content of their character. Thank you, Vincent. And um, I just want to clarify, I, I'm confident I know the answer, but I think it would be good to have it said aloud um, that the NAACP welcomes membership from white people. Absolutely. And I think Absolutely. it's important for people to know that in terms of local organizations um, that are working to be anti-racist. It's time to, to wind down. What I'd like to do is um, end this with a prayer, and then I've got lots of people I want to thank for making this possible, including the three of you, um, but this, we call this um, a sacred conversation, and I really believe it is um, sacred, and so if you would um, join with me and our viewers would join with me, I would like um, to offer a prayer. Sure. Creator God, who made every person in your own image, who loves everyone equally, whose will for all is life lived in harmony, with love for you and one another, with joy and gratitude for the love you have shown us. Forgive us all the ways we fail to live in such harmony. 
bless to our hearts and minds what has been said and heard and learned this evening, that we might grow into the people you call us to become. Empower us to hear and live the words of the prophet Micah, that you ask us to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you. We pray in your many names. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Vincent, Thank you. Jim, Thank and Harriet. You. Thank you for your time and your willingness to share some of your thoughts, some of your struggles, and some of what gives you hope. Um, I know I've learned a lot, and I'm confident that our visit observers, our watchers, um, have as well. I also want to thank Tony Falco, our Director of Technology, and Brad Van Houten on our audiovisual team for making all this work technically. And um, I want to thank Jen and the Justice Committee for their careful work in designing and creating meaningful questions. I would like Jen to say a word about them. The members of the Justice Committee are Kevin Barry, Ken Cyrus, Donna Gates, Diane Myers, Kate Sloan, and Joe Ricard, who just recently joined us. If you are interested in joining us, if you have questions or if you have suggestions for what the committee should do to continue the work of anti-racism, please email us at justice at naplesucc.org. We look forward to hearing from you. This presentation and all of the earlier sacred conversations about race and privilege are archived and available through Livestream.com. If you are new to Naples United Church of Christ, we invite you to join us for worship every Sunday at 10 a.m. via Livestream or Facebook Live. And if you're not you. If you are not new, we hope you'll come back. If you are not already on our mailing list, but would like to receive daily devotionals and information about services and events like this, please send your name, address, and email to wendy at naplesucc.org. Thank you for watching and learning with us. Good night. <laughs>